Hello, YouTube and library viewers. This is what I love about nature. This is what I love about going to random places on the Istrian Sea. So where we're staying right now while I'm recovering is uh, this little village on the Istrian coast in Croatia. It's called Prementura. Uh, there's not a lot of quiet space there. So I thought, okay, for the next episode of the Linux for Everyone podcast, I'm going to record in Studio C, <laughs> Studio C, which is the car because the car is really one of the best vocal boosts that you can get. Uh, and I even have a blanket in there for the sleigh dog. So, you know, extra sound dampening. And um, I think it'll sound really good. So I'm driving down this little dirt road in the forest and I stumble across this and I thought, I have no idea what to record here, but I have to record something because this is amazing. Like someone took the time to do this and then just left it there for someone else, you know? And I think that's so cool. Anyway. What you're about to listen to is an episode of the Linux for Everyone podcast. This is what kicked off kind of the brand months and months before I started the library and YouTube channels. Funny story, I originally started the YouTube channel just as another platform to publish the podcasts as just audio. And then something clicked and I finally got smart and I thought, hey, I maybe I should actually do some video. But what you're about to listen to is just an episode of the podcast. So if you're not into that, that's totally fine. But if you want to kick back and listen to it, there are timestamps for each segment. So you can still jump to whatever interests you the most. But if you do stick around, I hope you enjoy it. And until the next video proper, you guys take care and take care of each other. Coming up on this episode of Linux for Everyone, a discovery of the week that is a very welcome twist on a popular power management utility, and the developer himself is here to talk about it. Plus a short personal update about my little road to recovery and what I've been up to, and I will admit to you that I made a very, very big mistake with my choice of video editing software, plus one of your Linux origin stories, all coming up next. Well, hello, my name is Doug Jenkins, and we're listening to Linux for Everyone in Scott Depot, West Virginia. Welcome home. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to Linux for Everyone, and welcome home. I am coming at you from Studio C this time around, and the C stands for car. I am still staying in Prementura, Croatia. It's a little village on the Istrian coast. The space is wonderful, but it doesn't have a lot of quiet. So I decided I'm going to utilize one of the best vocal booths that you can possibly have, the car. It's well insulated. I've even got a blanket back here that we use for uh, our dog Slayer when we're taking him to the beach. And uh, so that'll provide a little bit of sound dampening. And I think it's it, it sounds really good to my ears anyway. I'm not using my professional mic because I'm not um, at home in the studio, but I'm pulling out the Blue Yeti and it's been it's been a lifesaver. It's been great. So I've been uh, using that and the ThinkPad P53 with Fedora to get my work done lately. And that has been a really, really pleasant experience. Right now though, it is time for your discovery of the week. And this time around, it's Auto CPU Freak. And we have a special treat because the developer himself agreed to introduce it and talk about it. So I will waste no time and I'll hand it over to him. Hi, I'm Adnan Hadzik and I'm the author of Auto CPU Freak or Auto CPU Freak Tool. The naming is open to interpretation. First time I tried Linux was in 99. And the reason why I'm saying this is, well, I just said something about my age there. But the reason why I'm saying this is a lot of things have changed in Linux since then. But one thing uh, that hasn't changed is power optimization and in general CPU optimization. Of course, there's a lot of kernel improvements for chipsets and their drivers. And on various uh, corporations are doing these optimizations for their needs. But again, 
the reason why I think this is happening is because Linux is still a server OS. It's uh, powering world's biggest companies today. Those companies uh, do some of these things, but they don't release it uh, open source or anything like that. Of course, there are other tools for uh, CPU frequency scaling, but the problem with these tools is that most of them need to be configured. Even when they are configured, like some things need to be done manually, and they still don't give you really the best of the both worlds. Like, for example, some of them will give you amazing battery, but for, for you to switch to performance mode, you need to uh, click a button or do something, which is not great for a regular user. For example, my wife, who's also a Linux user, I never saw her once that she like uh, clicked on uh, switch to, from power save to uh, performance. And again, ma doing things manually, I'm not really a fan of that. So some ideas were already proven with this uh, inside of my head. And I remember like last year I bought a new Lenovo X1 Carbon and I saw that CPU was throttling. There is a project which is aiming to resolve this problem, but it really didn't do, do anything for me. Also the CPU frequency scaling tool, which I was using, was not working. Uh, my uh, CPU fe frequency was capped, even due to all the configuration. It was New Year's, I was off for seven days, and I said, I'm just gonna start hacking some things uh, together. My idea was to create this, everything that I said here to create it, that it's automatic. So CPU speed and power opt optimizer for Linux, but the, the scaling, is happening on actively monitoring the uh, the CPU usage, uh, the system load, is the battery uh, charging or not. But ultimately to improve the battery life, but also not to compromise any system resources. So I did that actually, and I released it as open source, of course, on, on GitHub. And I shared it on Twitter and Reddit. And that's where it just kind of, uh, exploded not really but it was it was still yeah still got some uh, gained some traction uh, it already has a couple of contributors and uh, it's available as a snap package it also has a source installer for uh, for all distros there's also a UR package for Arch Linux and Manjaro and I really think you should try it out this is the only tool that I'm using now and I also have a lot of comments of people saying like, hey, thanks, this improved my Geekbench uh, results and uh, things like that. So uh, I also have some other ideas uh, how to improve this tool. And uh, for that, I would say just stay tuned. And uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Now, I've been using Auto CPU Freak for, I don't know, about a week on a couple different laptops, my Oryx Pro, as well as the ThinkPad P53 that I'm reviewing. And the installation was a snap. <laughs> it was very, very easy. Uh, whether, whether you're doing a snap install or you're simply uh, installing it from source, piece of cake. And I have to tell you guys, it's, it's brilliant. It basically refreshes every five seconds. It kind of checks, okay, what are your CPU core temperatures? What kind of system load is being put on the CPU right now? and how can we make this more effective? So for example, if I'm just sitting there idling, not really doing anything, and I'm on battery, it's going to turn a uh, turbo boost off and it will throttle down the CPU clocks for each core. Now, if I plug in, it, it's automatically going to just crank everything back up. And it seems to do a really competent job setting the performance that you need based on the task. You know, if I'm on battery, but all of a sudden I fire up Blender, it's going to uncap the performance. It's going to unleash those clock speeds, turn Turbo Boost on, and let me have all the power that I need. And like he said, it is basically a hands-off CPU freak. I, I think that's the best way to describe it. There's one more really important aspect to Auto CPU Freak that I feel is worth pointing out here. It can even be used on servers. So if you install this on a server farm of any kind, 
you could see a, a substantial cost reduction in your electricity bills. Anyway, you can check out his website at foolcontrol.org. All of the code for Auto CPU Freak is on GitHub. I'll have a link to both of those places on the show notes for this episode, episode 38. And uh, do stay tuned to the Linux for Everyone library and YouTube channels because I'll have a video spotlight of this app as well. So this next segment might actually double as a bonus discovery of the week, depending on your uh, your point of view and your experience with this app. So about two years ago now, I think it was almost two years ago, Alan Pope of Canonical, friend of the show and generally awesome guy, he recommended Standard Notes. And Standard Notes is an open source, multi-platform, note-taking app, kind of bare bones uh, when it comes to its free functionality, but encrypted, very, very reliable. Uh, it syncs across all the, you know, across Windows, iOS, Android, Mac, Linux, and really on an almost daily basis, I've been using it for the last two years. Uh, whether that's, you know, for jotting down ideas or um, adding to a very, very lengthy list of uh, community-suggested uh, Linux software or music or w whatever, uh, podcast ideas, segments, just, you know, all kinds of stuff. I used it for uh, a to-do list, uh, you know, grocery list, uh, you name it. And wherever I was and whatever that device I had in my hand, all of my, that brain dump was just kind of synced. And I, I love standard notes for that. But last week, I discovered that you can use an extension on Standard Notes called Listed to write and publish a blog. And that's all it takes, is <laughs> literally just Standard Notes and an extension that installs with one click. And that's it. That's, that's really it. It's, it's insane. Y you can just turn any of your existing notes into a blog post once you have a extended account, that of course allows you to use the extensions for standard notes. And so I finally splurged and bought the one year subscription to, you know, the nice premium version of standard notes and got these nice uh, themes installed and, and different editors and file safe, which lets you attach media to your uh, notes and <laughs> Um, it, I think it's money well spent. I really do. And of course, that that also enabled me to start a blog. And for a long time, uh, I've wanted to have a central place, like an idea repository where I can share some of those random mental doodles, uh, document certain things that I'm doing, brainstorm, uh, maybe even, you know, post the lyrics that I'm working on, short stories, like whatever, somewhere I can easily just write and publish whatever crosses my mind, whatever I feel is worth being out there in the world, you know? For so long, I have battled with things like WordPress. And not that WordPress is a bad product, it's an exceptional product, but I tend to hyper-focus on is the theming right? You know, is the CSS messed up? Uh, what's the font? And <laughs> just, I get so preoccupied with the polish and everything around writing something and publishing something that I never actually get to the writing part. And so the, this pure simplicity of just using standard notes as a way to publish a blog really struck a chord with me, and it's out there now. It's uh, listed.to slash at symbol Jason E. And uh, once again, that's listed.to backslash at Jason E. And I'll have a link to this new blog uh, in the show notes for this episode, of course. And right now, I've just got a couple posts up there. One um, kind of expanding on what I just said here about why I wanted to start a blog and how I did it. And the other one is kind of a running list of open source games um, that, I, that I personally want to check out. I tend to notice that if it's something I want to check out and look into, it might be something that you want to check out and look into. So that's another benefit of just being able to publish something without too much thought and just, and just put it out there into the world and, and let people discover it. 
Anyway, a few months ago, I teamed up with Liam over at GamingOnLinux.com, and we did a video about a really great open source game called Mindustry. And you can find that over on the YouTube or uh, library channels. But anyway, somebody in the comments section took the time, like went way above and beyond, and wrote out this list of what he considered good open source games. Not only that, but there was a little um, little small description of each game as well as, you know, whether or not you could find it in your, uh, your distro's repository. When I started this blog last week, I thought, you know, that's one of the things that really should not be confined to a buried comment section on an old video. So I, I cleaned up his post just a little bit and just threw it in there verbatim. And uh, that's there too. So, and in the future, I don't even know. It, it might be Linux stuff. It might be lyrics. It's just going to be whatever I feel like sharing. And um, the neat thing is that you can subscribe with just an email. And if you have that subscription, that email-based subscription, uh, you can also reply directly to uh, me and the post by email, which is a really nice touch. And there's even a guest book, which is so, uh, I don't know, so like 90s Alta Vista or something. But uh, it looks great. It's simple. And I'm going to stop gushing about it right now. By the way, that was only supposed to be a very quick bullet point in the beginning of this uh, this housekeeping session. <laughs> but I'm, I'm feeling a little more chatty than usual. So uh, no apologies for that, though. Uh, the other great bit of news is you guys have been asking for some stickers and Michael and the Destination Linux Network team have created the stickers. So there are stickers available now. There is a catch, though. It's the entire network. The, the, the thing is, it's, it's more economical. Um, it's a little bit more affordable when you're having stickers printed from a fulfillment place like Teespring. It's easier and more economical for all parties involved to sell sheets versus individual stickers. And so I think the solution that they came up with is we're going to have a sheet of, um, you know, two or three stickers from every single show or YouTube channel that's on the network. And I think that's actually a really cool idea because I'm going to plaster all of those uh, across one of my laptops. And I don't know if it makes as much sense to say, sell you 20 Linux for everyone stickers, because are you going to really use 20 of them? So the sticker sheet is available for about 10 euros. And you'll get stickers for DLN, the network, the Destination Linux network. You'll get stickers for the Destination Linux podcast, DOS Geek, Hardware Addicts, Pseudo Show, DLN Extend, Linux for Everyone, This Week in Linux, the Ask Noah Show, and uh, a few little icons sprinkled in there as well. So if you guys have been wanting some stickers of the various shows here at Destination Linux Network, get on that. Anyway, I hope you guys find some value in this uh, this sticker offering. I know I'm kind of excited about it. I've already bought a couple sheets. And I want to tell you one thing about Teespring, okay? This is the company that we use for our merchandise, like the Linux for Everyone coffee mugs and t-shirts and hoodies. They use a little bit of trickery, which I'm not too fond of. Like when you click this link, and I'll have the link to this uh, to the stickers on the show notes for this episode, you're going to click this link and it's going to say something like 12 hours left to buy. And it makes you think that it's a limited time product. I assure you guys, none of this stuff is limited time. It's not going to go anywhere as far as I'm aware. And so you don't have to feel like I need to rush to buy this. If you need to wait until you get paid, wait till you get paid. It's going to be there. Let me take a minute now to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of Linux for Everyone. DigitalOcean is the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized to make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and much more. And DigitalOcean recently announced a bunch of new features and services like virtual private cloud in all regions, free of charge. DigitalOcean has also added a couple new droplets, and this is a feature that I really love. Uh, they've added Jitsi, which is, of course, a open source web conferencing uh, Zoom alternative, which I like to use as often as possible, and a Minecraft server, quick install droplets. You can get all of this, plus access to their world-class customer support for as low as $5 US per month. You can get started on DigitalOcean for free right now with a $100 credit by going to do.co slash DLN. 
Just go to do.co slash DLN. And uh, I'd like to thank DigitalOcean once again for sponsoring this episode and the entire Destination Linux network. I think one of the reasons that I've been so chatty on this episode is uh, we don't get to touch base as often as we used to. Right now, I think I'm averaging a podcast episode every three weeks. That's because, as most of you know, unless you're brand new to the podcast, I have been recovering from Legionnaire's disease. I I did want to give you just a short update on things. I am doing okay. Uh... I'm on that road to recovery. It's it's slow and frustrating. There is forward progress. But I did want to call out something here. In episode 37, in the last episode, I expressed some concern that uh, coronavirus is actually going to make it crucial to pay attention to Legionnaire's disease. And I wish, I really honestly wish that I wouldn't have been so right about that. This is... <laughs> This is a really, I I just want to spread awareness about this, and I I really hope that you guys don't mind a a completely non-Linux thing here in this podcast, but um, this is worth talking about and worth spreading around. The headline from CNN Health, Coronavirus shutdown causes new risk at CDC, Legionnaire's disease. And, you know, one of you guys showed me this headline, and I flipped out because, my God, these are not two things that you want to worry about. I'm not going to get into it too much. Let me just let me just read a little bit of this article so that you guys can be aware of what to look for. And it, it, it all boils down to this. It's a problem that people across the country need to be on the lookout for, says the CDC. The Legionella bacteria, which can cause deadly pneumonia, I can tell you that's true, it, uh, it grows in warm or stagnant water, okay? The plumbing in buildings that have been closed for months because of the coronavirus pandemic could provide a perfect breeding ground for Legionella and other waterborne pathogens, the CDC cautions. It even happened to the CDC itself, guys. That's what the CDC told CNN. It happened to the CDC. They had to close down a bunch of their buildings and get them tested and fixed. And I'm urging you, when and if, I'm just going to say when, this coronavirus pandemic is in our rearview mirror and you're going back to school and back, you know, back to university, back to work, back to the gym, whatever. If it's a building that has plumbing and water, <laughs> insist that you see some kind of um, report of a Legionella bacteria test. Do not use the water there if you are not 100% certain that it has been cleared for Legionella or any other waterborne pathogen or disease or bacteria or whatever, because this is a serious thing. I don't want any of you to have to go through what I went through. Just be on the lookout, be safe, and uh, and be vigilant. All right? Okay, good talk. Still to come in this episode, I've got a really, really cool Linux origin story to tell you that came from the uh, the DLN community forum. But right now, I'm going to admit, I've made a huge mistake. (laughs) Um, I don't mind admitting my mistakes, especially when they can hopefully benefit other people and steer other people away from uh, making that same mistake. Oh, you guys. 
When I started the YouTube and library video channels for Linux for Everyone, I actually started using iMovie on my MacBook Pro. But then I thought, you know what? No, I've got to really, I've got to walk the walk. I want to walk the walk. I want to do my entire production workflow on Linux. And so I experimented with software like Olive, like OpenShot, like Caden Live. And none of those seemed to click with me. Either they were too buggy or they just did not have a workflow that made sense or features that I needed. And then I tried Lightworks. And I fell in love with it. I didn't care that it was professional software that, that's used by, uh, you know, Oscar, Oscar nominated uh, directors and editors or whatever. I'm just saying that because Lightworks was used to edit the Netflix film, The Irishman. Uh, I didn't care about any of that, though. I just cared that the workflow clicked. And after watching a couple tutorials, I just got it. And it was constantly saving and I never lost any work. Then I saw, well, okay. If I want to export anything beyond 720p, you know, if I want 1080p and maybe down the road 4K video, then I've got to pay up. Now, Lightworks offers three different packages. Well, technically, technically they offer four packages. Free, monthly, yearly, and outright. Now, free, it's, it's nice to play with, but if you're serious about any kind of video production, it's out of the question, right? So monthly is 19, well, monthly is about 20 euros, which I think is pretty expensive. Yearly is 134 euros and outright is 337 euros, but that's a permanent license. I ended up buying the yearly license, but I got it for 40% off uh, because my friend Matt, who is also a co-host of DLN Extend, which you guys should check out. It's a great little show on the network. Um, he was able to give me a 40% off code. So I was like, okay, I'll bite. Now, when you buy Lightworks. When you pay for Lightworks, you get to activate it on two machines. You guys know how much hardware I go through. <laughs> um, so you get to activate it on these two machines and it binds itself to your hardware. Fortunately, not to your operating system. So for example, I've got Lightworks on my big, my big rig, my big boy, uh, the Falcon Northwest Talon, which is my like office production machine. It's just beastly. I can switch distros on that thing as much as I want and, and re-register because it binds to the hardware. So that's a nice thing. But what I'm coming to realize is it's also kind of an evil thing because that leaves me one other license. And I do a lot of my work on laptops because I'm constantly reviewing and evaluating laptops. Um, and right now, you know, I've got a 16-core desktop Ryzen laptop from, uh, wait, that didn't make any sense. I have a laptop from Tuxedo Computers that boasts the AMD Ryzen 9 3950X desktop CPU. I've got my Oryx Pro. I've got the brand new sixth generation Oryx Pro to review. I've got the ThinkPad P53 to review. I've got Slimbooks. I've got, I'm, and I, I like to use these systems as my own, as my daily driver so that I get to, I think, more fairly and more comprehensively uh, talk about them. Well, I've got Lightworks on my desktop. I've got Lightworks on my Oryx Pro. And that's it, guys. I can't... I I'm recording this podcast on the ThinkPad P53. I'm, I'm doing... I'm shooting some YouTube video using uh, OBS on it. But I can't throw Lightworks on here and edit. Uh, because... It is bound to two pieces of hardware. Now, sure, maybe if that hardware breaks, I can email the company behind Lightworks and beg them to, um, I guess, release that registration and let me bind it to a different piece of hardware. But that hardware might become irrelevant for me in a few months or a year. The mistake I made was embracing Lightworks because, oh, yay, I love it. And hey, they make a you know native Linux package, and that's great. Good for you guys. I'm going to support you. Here's my money. But then I realized, man, this is, this is commercial software that's not open source and is not giving me my freedom. I would rather pay Caden Live or Olive or OpenShot. I'd rather give them some money and say, hey, you know, let's, um, let's try and make this a, a better product to, to fit, you know, more people's needs, uh, more people's professional and, 
and hobbyist needs, right? But let me use it on any system that I want. Yeah, I made a mistake by not choosing open source. That's the bottom line. I made a mistake by not choosing open source. And I think that there comes a point where, yes, maybe I should sacrifice convenience a little bit for more flexibility and more freedom. Maybe I need to figure out how to get Caden Live not to be so buggy. Maybe I need to learn how to use OpenShot. Maybe I need to learn to live without a certain feature that Lightworks has so that I can easily put this software on any hardware that I want because it's open source and because I have the right to do that. I have the freedom to do that. So your mileage may vary. I just wanted to have a little discussion about that. And, and this comes, by the way, this comes after my associate producer, Oliver, worked with the Lightworks company to get us an affiliate code. So like right now, you can register at lwks.com and use L4E40 to get a 40% off uh, of the, the one-year Lightworks Pro license. You can do that. But even in the midst of us doing that, I don't know if I can continue to personally endorse the software because of the way that it binds itself and locks itself to a limited number of systems. And so now I'm in the position where, well, back to open source then. Uh, if you guys have feedback for me, you know, you watch the channel, you see kind of the, the production level. It's not super high, but you see what I'm doing. And if you've got some suggestions that you think will work or maybe some workarounds or just any kind of feedback about this whole, this whole segment that I've been talking about, um, shoot me an email, Linux for everyone. And that's spelled out Linux for everyone at pm.me. And the PM.me stands for uh, Proton Mail. So to get in touch with me anytime about anything, it's Linux for everyone at PM.me. And to take you out of this episode on an uplifting note, I think it's time for another Linux origin story. There are tons and tons of these in the Destination Linux Network Community Forum. It's by far one of the most uh, popular and most active posts in that forum. It's just kind of a, a blast to browse through every once in a while. Anyway, this is courtesy of Jacob K. And it reads like this. So Jacob starts this post with a photo. And the photo shows a Mandrake 7.0 CD and a Storm Linux CD. And these came with a magazine back in uh, the year 2000. So this is what he says. I guess I am about to have my 20 year anniversary with Linux. I tried them out and I was fascinated. But since I was a hardcore gamer, I had to go back to Windows 98. I spent the next few years working with internet cafes, setting up and optimizing their gaming PCs in a few Windows based game servers. Once I was asked to go to a large internet cafe to set up their Counter Strike server, but when I arrived, the server just looked like this. And he shows a screenshot of a uh, Linux terminal prompt. Nobody there knew anything about Linux. They just got the server from some company that went bust. So I would spend the next two days going back and forth between the closet and server room and one of their gaming PCs, where I would point out man pages and forum posts, trying to put something together that would do the trick. Eventually, I learned about Bash, WGET, Screen, and the Half-Life Linux server, and I continued setting up more and more gaming servers over the next several years, until finally, in 2009, I switched to running Linux full-time on my own PC, and I haven't looked back since. Share your story with us at discourse.destinationlinux.network. And with that, I think episode 38 is a wrap. A special thank you to my 96 patrons who seem to stick around through thick and thin, uh, who seem to not delete their pledges just because I get sick and, uh, and disappear for a few weeks. You guys, you're champions, and um, I really want to thank you for your support. Just so you guys know, you can become a patron for as little as $2 a month, and that gets you early access to the podcast, and it gets you early videos as well, and a few other things. And uh, I'm actually thinking about adding uh, maybe a $10 or $20 tier and including a um, custom patron-only coffee mug. If you guys like that idea, let me know. Linux for everyone at pm.me.
And I'll see you guys for the next episode. In the meantime, lots of social links for you to hang out with the entire Linux for Everyone community on Telegram, on Discord, on Twitter, on Mastodon, on YouTube. All of those links are available on the podcast website and in the show notes for this episode. 2020 is tough, you guys. Keep your head up, take care, and take care of each other.